So it's been like a decade since Miyazaki's released a film, and I had the luxury to be able to go to a press screening in London and see that new film, The Boy and the Heron. And that was definitely made a lot more possible by the sponsor of today's video, Cool Shirts. If you want to be a drip king like me, you should absolutely check out their website since they have a variety of styles for all different types of taste, with plenty of sharp visuals, like the design of a tummy tee here. It's a pretty goofy fella on it, but as a man of IBS, I do relate to his struggle very fiercely. And of course, I'm an aficionado of the dragon themed jacket, so the dragon jacket is up my uh, alley, I gotta say. This one's actually pretty amazing, I love the uh, this little texture, it's really comfy, just the feel of wearing it. It's just got a lot of warmth to it especially when you're wearing it out. I wore it the whole time in my trip in London. I gotta say it did me very well, especially that inner pocket, very nice for keeping my notes and such. There's a lot of really good small things in terms of the quality on it, just like the zipper's shimmer and it's a little design with a skull in it, and even the embroidering of the design, it's all really top notch. And as someone who's usually a bit of a vagrant when he's not wearing his drip, it's rare for me to buy newer stuff. So this is a real nice change of pace to have something that feels absolutely quality. So if you want your 10% off and to support the channel, you should check my link in the description for shirts with a said dot cool slash Stephen. Thank you very much. And we'll get back to the video. But yes, Boy in the Heron, that was a bit of an ordeal. Lots of travel. And I did originally try and get one of those uh, public screenings, but they saw it instantaneously. There's a lot of demand on this one. And even the press screening was completely full by the time I walked in. Luckily, uh, I did find a seat bit close to the front, though I could just see every little detail on display, which was not something most people had seen beforehand because they had a very strict no press uh, attitude at first to the advertising campaign of this movie. So for the sake of fairness, I won't be using any clips from the movie in this video. I'm going to give people the opportunity to see it when it hits uh, its public release in a couple of months. And that also helps me avoid Ghibli's onslaught too. But I feel if you want to take it blind, I think it's a perfectly fun way of doing it though it is mainly just press, and they have sort of changed their tune a bit since then. I will be talking about the innards of the film too, so take that into account. So our story here of the production is going to start with the death of Michio Yasuda, who was Ghibli's colorist and has worked with Miyazaki on pretty much every one of his movies. And she had told him at one point about, you should make another movie, you shouldn't end it here. And after she died, Miyazaki made a statement about how he didn't feel like just waiting to die, and that he was energized again to do something. At least that's how The NeverEnding Man paints it. So after pitching the premise of the film and putting together the storyboards over several months, he gets the green light. Six years later, that film is done. And I gotta say, just to make it clear, this is not a radical departure from Miyazaki. This is not gonna be something like Kaguya. This looks, as we know, from a Miyazaki cell animated film, at least aesthetically. Even though there are some slight changes, you know, there's some bells and whistles, nicer lighting and bloom effects from the more modern era, digital camera distortion and other effects like that. And even if Yasuda isn't the colorist anymore, the people who are working on the film are people who have been at the studio a long time and they create a palette that feels cohesive with the rest of Miyazaki's work. A lot more green and earthy tones though, but it works. We could say the same for the core animation staff. There's probably maybe about 26 people here and most of them are Ghibli staples who've been working with Miyazaki since at least Princess Mononoke. And a couple of them left the studio years ago, but they're back again. Where the real difference comes in though is in the animation director, Takeshi Honda. Back in the old days, Takeshi Honda was a Gainax staple. He's very talented and he's been working with Miyazaki since about Ponyo. And in ways, he's basically became his golden boy. So the very first work of Miyazaki that I got involved in was Ponyo. Toward the end of the film, I did the last final few cuts. I heard from someone that Miyazaki said, oh my God, I didn't know he did this. I really wanted it and I didn't realize someone could actually do it. He was really impressed with my work. So since then, I just get offers from him, and I'm really happy to work with him. Hence why Miyazaki is going to trust him in this regard, because in this movie, Miyazaki is not checking any of that animation anymore. He's just working on the storyboards. He's basically doing cut to cut, and then the animators will come in and do it scene by scene. Honda was a bit hesitant, because he was also a staff member at Kara, working as the animation director of the Rebuild franchise. He can't just leave to work with Miyazaki whenever he likes. But Toshio Suzuki was able to convince Arno to lend him out for the entire movie. And the rest is history. In 2017, in the summer, those two start the film together, and Honda starts doing the first cuts of the movie. But Honda had complete creative control in this movie, and he was doing whatever he wants with those animation cuts from some of the finest people in the industry. He's nowhere as strict as Miyazaki, he would let them creatively flourish, while also keeping a fair consistency between them all. Even from Ghibli staples, a lot of beautiful character acting in ways you've never seen before, and stuff like 
completely uncorrected shots by Shinya Ohira. He does the opening sequence here and it's absolutely amazing. Not to mention, he doesn't get just one scene, he has multiple throughout the whole film. It's pretty wild out there. And even if the film begins with a lot of stillness, a lot of clarity and small moments and even stuff where there's barely any motion, but it's still moving. Tiny little details like that really sell the movie. But in contrast, there are also gigantic set pieces of animation that feel completely incomprehensible. And I'd almost expect that to be the after effect of crunch, but apparently to the production, there was no crunch because there was no deadline. So they just kind of absolutely went for it. As well as having other parameters like shut down the lights at 6 p.m., you shut down the whole of Ghibli, complete weekends off, and that created a staff environment which was much more chill and nice, and people weren't turning into zombies as the production went, and they were able to keep their vitality for much longer, which uh, I know is absolutely crazy of an idea, but you can't argue with those results. I mean, Miyazaki's like 82 now, so crunch is probably not the most productive thing for him, and he's really just spending his time doing those storyboards, writing them out, thinking about the story, and then when that scene's done, you throw the animators in. That's how it goes now. And despite that, the story still has some interesting quirks to it, and it sort of almost presses on itself, but maybe not for the reasons it usually does. There's no sprint here going on. What we do get is a very dark and eerie beginning to this movie. It's generally uncomfortable in a way I haven't seen in a Miyazaki movie before. And the music from Joe Hisashi is almost unrecognizable at points. It's so uncomfortable and off kilter that it really sells these scenes. At some points, it almost feels like you're watching a silent film because the music and visuals are just selling the scene. You need no words to really understand what's going on and on top of that the sound effects are amazing especially in that big screen it really sold the atmosphere and it sort of pulls you in in a very hypnotic way where it's almost hard to escape it it is also unbelievably visceral at times ugly like no other way and you could say almost gothic in its approach there with its delusions and guilt encompassing itself from a very traumatic event all coming together in such a way where it's hard to tell where the magic begins and the delusion ends and then the second half happens and things change quite rapidly and it's more fantastical and suddenly you feel like you're in a purgatory that can only echo Miyazaki's prior movies uh, and that's a little bit different than what I was expecting let's say that much well, we went from the darkest sections of the first movie, now we go into some of the goofiest in any of his films, and there's a character they actually introduce based off Toshio Suzuki, you know, the head of the house here, who is played off the main character in the second half, almost in like a buddy-buddy way where it's all slapstick and comedic and goofy, and not to say the first half doesn't have any humour, it balances the darkness with some good little references here and there, but this is on a different level. You really know you're back in familiar territory when the Ghibli food comes out. In the first half, the war scarcity means that the food isn't necessarily that flashy, and there's even a scene where the main character says the food tastes like shit, and I was like, whoa, Miyazaki, back off. You are being a little too drastic right now. But in the second half, we get a classic breakfast food cut that looks like it's straight out of Atsuko Tanaka, and it may well be because she's in the credits. That's when the nostalgia and warmth comes in, and it's also accompanied with those classic Joe Hisashi kind of chords and it creates a real dissonance between these two halves which makes it hard for me to contextualize my thoughts on it all in that like i really really resonate with that first half i think it's incredibly strong and as i was watching it there was a point where i was like wow this might actually be one of my favorite ghibli movies ever the second half though is like a pretzel of self-referential allegory that it's hard for me to kind of contextualize my feelings on it it's so dense that i feel like i need to spend more time with it or rewatch it but i can't do that anytime soon to really get a feeling of like where i'm about that because i don't even know why that direction happens was that intentional did miyazaki sort of go back on himself it's not the first time he would have went back on the original intention of a project and completely changed it though there is no massive sprint deadline here that could make that uh, more likely is it producers is suzuki coming in and going like add a bit more fantasy add a bit more fantasy come on like ghibli's known for its fantasy this film was very very expensive we need to make it back don't make it too weird like make it weird but maybe make it weird like you like your other film weird <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, it could have absolutely just all been on Miyazaki. After all, he's focusing on those boards, on that story all the time. And if you look at something like Ehoba's blog over here, you can see that 
he can catalogue a lot of the referential points in the movie. There's a lot of density there to different pieces of history, of fantasy, and other texts. So I'm not going to say this is a messy or sort of like rushed thing at all. There's something there for sure. I just don't know if it's something that I'm on board with. Credit where credit is due, though. That cut towards the end is something else. It's pure Kino, basically. It, it kind of almost ties these two halves of the project together, and it feels like the emotional peak of just, like, visceral energy. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, oh, I guess this must be coming right to the end, right? Where can you go from there? And then it starts going that way, and I'm like, ah, we're ending, we're ending. And then it's like, oh, there's another 20 minutes plus. And I'm like, oh, okay. I guess we gotta keep going. Though, not to discredit that there is a lot of uh, splendor and fireworks in that ending that kind of blow in it up and they do their, their things and it's not like it doesn't sort of tie itself up together in the end but it's uh it's different and that also gets down to uh the way they have began to advertise on the english side and i think this is always intentional there's a there's a feeling of like this is semi-autobiographical and i begin to ask the question of how because there are definitely some broad strokes here which are like, yeah, they're very obviously that that's resonates to Miyazaki's early life and his guilt or whatever. But then when you get to that second half, it, it falls so far into this maze that it becomes hard to really contextualize like, well, where does the fantasy begin and the, the person end? It feels like I'm navel gazing towards this image of a person I'm supposed to perceive. What I am reminded of is something that Arno once said about Miyazaki, that as a director, he is never able to take his underwear off. He's always wearing them in those kind of scenes. And here it feels like Miyazaki really did take all his clothes off, and then he was like, ah, oh, maybe not, and he cut, grabs a, a bundle of bandages, he throws them over himself, and he jumps into the mud, and it's just... It, it, yeah. Now, if you really want to look at the sort of more behind the scenes, I know that Full Frontal will be talking to a lot of staff from the movie towards the end of the year, this year. So uh, when it's out, I'll probably link to it uh, over here or something. But I'm sure it will be a very engaging read um, into the insight of how it was to work on this film. Probably will be like a once in a life opportunity for some. There is something else worth bringing up, especially towards the second half in terms of where this is all going. And that has to do with the concept of how do we live? How will we live? And it's a kind of a sentiment that Miyazaki seems really obsessed with since the work of, I guess, mid-90s, the end of his Nausicaa manga. This idea of that, yeah, the world is rough and terrible and harsh, and how do we exist within it or continue through without falling into complete nihilism? And that seems to come back and back and back again and again and again. And here you could say that this is almost like his final note on this, and he, he's really giving a conclusive putting the book down be like this this is it and um if we're happy or satisfied with the the message there or not is up for debate but there's probably some closure there and talking about how do you live that was the original title for the japanese release and even though uh that is the name of a novel in Japan, that is not what the film is based off, though the ethos of that book does follow through, since it is a book on ethics for children, and effectively, how do you become a, how do you become a good person? That's kind of the idea behind the, uh, the novel in question. I actually gave the whole thing a read, and it was uh, interesting at times, and other times a little bit tedious. But what it does at least help with is there are certain points of the film which this sometimes recontextualized a little bit about the idea of it doesn't matter if you make mistakes, it's all about where you become. Specifically since this book was written during the sort of war-torn periods of Japan and the sort of nationalistic militarization was thick in the air. There is a quote in the, uh, the book towards the end which I thought was quite fitting for maybe what Miyazaki was going for here. People feel sad and suffer like this because it's not natural to have such hatred and hostility towards each other. Also because it's wrong that they cannot freely cultivate the talent with which they were born. Generally, when people feel they are miserable, when people suffer, it's because of that kind of misery isn't natural. Copper, we must find a way to draw knowledge from our suffering and sadness. The world makes you cruel and you have to bear it. And the second half of this movie is almost like a healing process through the fantastical that leaves you for the other side to accept that not all things last. And you could also see Maybe this is Miyazaki trying to create some sort of template for the next generation himself. 
not dissimilar to the actual novel that he's taking inspiration from. In Miyazaki's old age, I get the impression he's not really worried about following standard filmmaking procedures anymore. I think he's kind of just doing as he pleases, which is fair enough. And he's kind of pushing his own route there. And um, in a way, I wonder if instead of how do you live, this is really also then how do you market? Because I don't know if they really knew. Maybe that's why they went for that zero press mentality. Well, promoting the film because I think there's definitely going to be a struggle to put it any other way although they do seem to be slowly changing their mind on that so Sugi has mentioned that this might be the most expensive anime movie ever made and while it sort of had a really strong opening the lack of press has kind of left it sort of teetering and um, maybe a little flatter than they would have liked overall and because of that, it seems, especially when it's gotten too closer to this international release, they've been pushing it a little bit more. You've started to see trailers from different countries and preview images and all this other stuff, and lots of different um, attempts at getting your attention. I think over time, like most of these Miyazaki movies, it's going to do fine. I don't think there's really a concern there, especially when it gets to its physical releases and all that other stuff. But the general audience response, I don't know. I see critics like it, but they always like the Ghibli stuff, so I don't think that's really really crazy but when I went to my screening I did see a lot of mixes of opinions there was kind of like an awkward clap at the end parts of the films people were laughing with the film the other part they were kind of nervously laughing at the film confused at the end I heard people say things like yeah I guess it was all right but you know it's been done or maybe they'd be saying things like that was batshit I loved it so there's a lot of variety there and um Maybe that's part of what makes it kind of interesting there, but it is a little bit more divisive and I could see people talking about it for years to come. Maybe some people will just go, that was trash and forget about it. But I do feel it is definitely worth seeing and um, at the very least for the amazing visuals from that team and the people working along it. There's a lot of other big animation studios working along Ghibli on this one and it's probably not something you're going to see in the same way anytime soon but don't worry kids don't worry i know i know you're thinking miyazaki this is gonna be his last movie we've been talking to miyazaki and he says he is ready to make more films for you so check it out in 2030 he's gonna blast your eyeballs out with the next amazing film and um yeah the press team seemed really obsessed with uh making sure you know that they're like don't worry there's still more coming from ghibli ghibli's not dead yet we're still going and maybe that takes a little bit of the little bit of the potence off it that I mean, they haven't even finished the, the cinema tour, guys. Can you can we can we wait a little bit? Like, it'll take a while if he ever does. And I'm gonna be honest, I don't know if I'm really convinced that um he has it in him to finish another film. Takaha also was vaguely looking into the idea of doing another film too, and we saw what happened there. And I don't really get the best encouragement from people like Suzuki. You know, his reputation notwithstanding. Last time I saw him quote about this, he was saying how like, oh, last time I was talking with Miyazaki, he's completely forgotten what happened in that last one he just made. And I'm like, oh, okay. A couple years back, before Miyazaki retired the first time, he had made some sort of statement along the lines of he felt that he was destined to die in the process of making his magnum opus, um, never stopping. And that's possibly quite likely, I guess, if he continues going the path he's going to go. And the uncertainty of the future with Ghibli has led them to be bought by Nippon Television, who will keep their creative freedom, but it means that there is a new era coming for that company, if Miyazaki stays or not. It's going to be maybe a little uncertain for some. And if you don't want this channel to have massive uncertainty, join my Patreon! So that's people like Lenny, Tim James Richards, Joven, Daniel Strait, Ascarel, Stratogen, Stratos, Chunks, J, Foxmold, OT, Paul, Steven's mum, Sub Sofa, Taku Kisuki, Systematic, Karen, Nick, Doji, and Peter. Thank you very much, as well as everyone else here. There is a more unedited version of my thoughts, or maybe a little bit more spoilerful, on the Patreon too, through the Anime Corner series I do. About six or so of those already, where I just talk about anime and other stuff I've seen recently, or watched in general. And next video is going to be House Moving Castle, which is the finale of the Ghibli season. So look forward to that.